Hello, I'm Richard Osgood. I'm an archaeologist with the Ministry of Defence, and I'm really delighted to be able to be taking part in the current archaeology live conference, even if it is a bit peculiar, me sat at home in my front room and fully expecting to cat jump back out the jump on me at any point. Anyway, I'm going to talk to you about a piece of field work we were able to do in 2020 at a place called Dunch Hill on Salt Plain Training Area. It's a magnificent piece of landscape, incredibly unsport, even though it is located by the busiest private training area on the uh, MOD estate on the plain. Now, one of the things that I've been wanting to do over the years on the plane is to locate some settlements connected with the Bronze Age, especially with the later Bronze Age, because we have such a rich late Bronze Age landscape and detail of the earlier Bronze Age that we need to find out where, the, where these people actually lived. And the, the reason for doing this field work was also to evaluate the effects of military training of various sorts and indeed planning upon the deposits that we've got in a particular area on Salisbury Plain, and we can therefore help do um, work out management regimes and curatorial elements based on, on what the effects of the training has been. Now, I'll show you a couple of images here that relate to that Bronze Age landscape. You can perhaps see on the, the middle image the late Bronze Age linear running from the bottom and then snaking around something we don't know quite what it is, which is exciting in its own right. And they're going up to Kilbarrow and the Olympic Long Barrow on the seven and uh, the Long Barrows and the plane to continue onwards. You'll probably also be able to see that that linear ditch from the late Bronze Age cuts through some earlier field systems, county fields, um, and there's a lot more study that can be done there. Richard Bradley's book is phenomenal on the late Bronze Age linears on the training area, and I advise you to have a look at that. On the right, we've got a more of the earlier find, and this is a polyderm from an early Bronze Age burial mound just outside Nether Raven, air basins held by Tom Feed from Lundmark, who was uh, one of the individuals that reported to me that the Badger had unearthed a lot of ceramics, or as the contractor reported to him, pieces of crockery, from, from a, a set in a burial mound, and we therefore had to look at it as part of the Heritage at Risk program. So this colour then was discovered, um, part of the funerary landscape of the Bronze Age on Salisbury Plain. Uh, of course, we've got many, many hundreds of burial mounds. This is my favourite collection. This is the site called Silk Hill in the Bullford Rifle Ranges. The favourite because you have the gamut of burial mound types. You have pond barrow, disc barrow, bowl barrow, bell barrow, a huge range of them. And we <clears throat> look to protect these from burrowing animals here, um, from rabbits in this case, uh, through a scheme of covering them with mesh, has been altogether very successful. In other even however, we were a little bit late to um, and the material that was thrown out in addition to the collodern were these rather wonderful assemblage elements from the earlier Bronze Age. As you can see, there's a, um, an archer's wrist card or bracer in the top left, along with two items that are referred to as being arrow straighteners. And this article has just been published in the Butcher Archaeological and Natural History magazine if you want to chase it up. And we've also got a, uh, an antler handle with little circular decorations on with a bronze chisel within it and it's such a well-preserved piece it almost looked like it had been dropped by one of the workmen who had been trying to mesh over the barrow it was that well um, preserved and also um, a little bronze saw we've had two pieces of that so a very very impressive collection of goods but where did these people live they farmed here they um, buried their dead here they landscape components together with the, the big linear divisions that they must have lived somewhere. And in fact, we've only got one location on the 38,000 hectares of Salisbury Plain where we do know there was some Bronze Age uh, housing. And this is the site of Dunch Hill. And it was examined in part when a, um, a military road scheme had been put in, uh, looked at by uh, Phil Andrews of Wessex Archaeology and his team. Uh, they discovered there were a, a series of round houses which lay beneath the road, uh, and you can see the, the publication here. Now, I thought that it would have been too big a, a coincidence that that particular track picked up all of the, um, the round houses in the settlement, and I thought this would be the ideal location for us to go and have a, a further look and see whether or not 
that particular area had more of a housing estate from the late Bronze Age period. And the reason being is because this area is still tracked over by uh, military vehicles. It was heavily used during the journey for Afghanistan and Iraq, where there were a series of um, sort of flat roofed buildings that we put there as a, a center of population to put some urban complexity into it. In fact, we added um, graves to the landscape to make it um, a cultural landscape as well. Um, furthermore, it had been farmed for many years, which is why it was on heritage risk. And the flowers now have been uh, removed. We've removed the plant consent from that particular area. But I wanted to know just how damaging that particular element was. What was intriguing about these uh, roundhouses is the nature of the post holes. You can see on the, uh, the image on the right, they were in a pretty good circle. Um, they were relatively big post holes. And there was also a central post hole. With this structure, which is which is pretty unusual. Here's an aerial photograph of the particular area we were looking at. Um, if I put my cursor, so there is a track, which is the, the main military track to the driver training area, but you'll also be able to notice these field systems. And this is the plowed area. Apart from the plowed area, everything there is, is particularly designated both the triple SI, site of special scientific interest, and also as a scheduled monument. Right next to the track, you can see uh, um, we're in a location that is um, potentially under threat from, from heavy military vehicle usage. So that's what I wanted the you know, team to have a look at as a challenge it too for anyone who's interested in military kit. When you overlay the historic environment record data from Workshop Council that we've developed with them over the years, you can see a really important prehistoric landscape of linears, of burial mounds, of field systems. This is the, um, the, uh, the real nub of the issue. This is what I wanted to establish, just what this housing estate from the late Bronze Age, if that's what we thought, was, was relating to. You can also perhaps see the little four white blobs. Those are the flat roof pullings of the ISO containers that were a training objective. They've now been removed, but that was a, a, a key component from the military, which made this particular site potentially vulnerable. And another key element for us was to set it in as wide a context as possible over this wonderful chalk grass. And this is a, a team from Wessex Archaeology with their toad array putting their, their magnetometry kit over the area just so that we could get as much data as we can for the, the landscape. Um, we're waiting on the results there, but you can still see there, they're pretty good. This is a, I nearly just took off my phone when the, the traps were working away um, through, the, through the impediments of some of the, the larger bits of grassland, uh, which were getting in the way of the wheels. You can see, again, the field systems are turning out, they're seeing quite big anomalies, um, ditches. We've got an exciting landscape, so that the geophysics is working and we're doing it over many, many hectares. Right, so we stripped the, the area with the JCB. Um, and it's this wonderful chalky tableau um, with the dark elements in it, but like a Dalmatian, I suppose, in many ways, with these dark dots on a white background. Um, really, really very clear. And from my perspective, even just through stripping off the, the chalk, it gave me a, a lot of information because you can see that there are some striations on this that indicate that the plowing had been quite damaging going into the chalk. And we've also got these very glacial components with slightly lighter brown elements on it, which you do find across the, uh, the training area and the wider Salisbury Plain landscape, but uh, really nice, obvious features. Um, just to make a point for you, you've got the, uh, the most obvious post hole in the world on the left there, really lovely dark circle um, cut into the white chalk with the with slightly lighter orangey brownish colour being some of the very glaciers, but very, very clear archaeological features. Um, and in the area that we stripped, the majority of these were actually at the, the top end of site. There were lots of them. And the site was a bit of a, a Swiss cheese in many ways with so many holes. Um, and it was, the problem is to really try and work out what was going on and to find whether these were roundhouse structures or whether there were other components to it. We think we've got some in a um, more linear form halfway through the, the stripped area which could have been fence lines, or more likely some of these four post structures, maybe for granaries that you see in the Bronze Age and also in the Iron Age. It's very famous examples, of course, at places like Embry Hill Fort, which is pretty close. It formed a very good part of our Nightingale programme, whereby allowing service 
personnel and veterans who've been wounded in action um, to, to, to learn about archaeology and the benefits of that and their, and their recovery process. And we've got some great examples of people paired up with um, some of our civilian veterans working away to work out what, what's going on in our, our area, not only doing the, the site cleaning, but evaluating those features. And I'm going to talk to some young uh, artillerymen in the background who are driving past in some of their big heavy artillery just to be nosy and working out what, what's going on on their training area. It's also a good site that you could undertake in a socially distanced fashion, really, really good. Our four post structures were magnificent because the post holes were pretty much two metres apart. So you could really do some good, um, safe archaeology during the pandemic. And here are two of our veterans working away on, on scraping through, excavating and evaluating post hole. I mentioned the four post structure and the, uh, the nice two metre clearance. Well, here you go. This is your socially distanced archaeological feature that could have been designed for working in such restrictions. They're well formed. Some of them are packed with flint. They're of a good size. Uh, and we had two of these in a row just to be on the west of the structure that we were looking for, the, the roundhouse. The site was also covered in these things, ripped up bits of chalk through uh, tree throws, um, very indicative, very, very clear things when you get on archaeological sites on the chalk. It's basically like a, a half moon shape, a crescent, and you can see where the, uh, the direction of the tree is even blown down. This was actually a, a pine tree that had fallen down um, about half a mile away from the excavation, so we were able to show people exactly what one of these things looks like, and they were able to evaluate those into the chalk bedrock. The other good thing about the small circular features, these post holes, is that the majority of them had factual components that will assist us in, in dating the structure. And uh, you can see Carlos here working on one of the post holes which held some of the late Bronze Age pottery. And we had a lot of that on site. Here's uh, some photographs of this pottery being held. Uh, it's my hand, I think, holding some of the, the, the quite rudimentary and quite scruffy nature. These aren't glamorous late Bronze Age pots. These are are fairly roughly tempered, um, as you can see by the example of one of the, the Bath rugby players in the in the fine strike. But we were getting indicative late Bronze Age pottery, which was great to uh, uh, further emphasise that this is a late Bronze Age set of structures. And I suppose the, the, the most delightful find out of all of these objects that we got was this little um, disc-headed pin from the late Bronze Age. And you can see Chris, one of our veterans, finding it in um, the feature he was working on. In fact, it was a military feature. It was a, um, a four-man position that had been cut through the chalk, but had managed to preserve a lot of the late Bronze Age material in this particular hollow um, and preserve it from the plow. So finding a late Bronze Age item within a, a military feature, a bit of serendipity, but nevertheless, we were very pleased to get it. So that was the, um, the one super find from the entire programme. But making sense of the, the roundhouse was tricky because there were so many post holes. So here's a mixture of archaeologists and veterans um, trying to work out precisely which hole was relevant to a circular structure. And we managed to find one that did make sense. Or I should say we, it was Phil Andrews of Wessex Archaeology uh, with his, with his colouring pens that eventually made sense. And here you have a late Bronze Age house, um, post holes in a good circle. It too appears to have a central post hole. Now, whether or not that's structural, we don't know. And it was associated again with these, these four post structures. And there's various phases going on here because you can see a four post structure cutting what we think to be the house. Um, but there were, were several others relating to it and maybe also a fence line just on the, on the edges of the, the hut circle as well. And that's where we come into our, our next phase because what we want to do is that to really learn a lot more about these late Bronze Age houses, and what better way to do that than to try and build one ourselves. This is what we're going to try and attempt at Butzer Ancient Farm, which is uh, pretty close to the site, just outside of Winchester. Um, you can see they've got a fantastic Iron Age little village. They've got um, a Roman structure. There's a uh, Saxon building, and, and also there's the wonderful Horton Neolithic structure that's just been built. But there is a gap in the market. There is a place for a Bronze Age hut to be placed, and that's what we're going to do with our veterans based on the Dunshill examples. There's the, the recent Horton site, very, very striking. 
So one of the things we got the veterans to do was to go away and have a look at other Bronze Age huts and houses that exist um, throughout the UK, uh, especially in the regions that they're living in, so they can um, work out the sorts of things that we could um, use to build it, what sort of items there are going to be locally to Punch Hill and whether that relates to a, a pattern nationwide. Um, Quim's Pound is the stone built structure on the left and then you've got a Cornish example on the right. Must Farm, of course, is the, the go-to monument, I suppose, from the, the Bronze Age, from the Bronze Age to look at how houses were built and what went into them because we wanted to, to furnish these things as well. We don't just simply want a structure and this is something that's we're keen on getting our team to go along and, and repair over the years too. And what on earth is on the roof? Do we have turf? Do we have reeds? Do we have rushes? Do we have um, others such as straw? We, we've got to look at local elements to lunch at Salisbury Plain. Um, there's a very young Francis Parr up a flag fence stood on the roof uh, of, one of one of the houses there. Um, but work out precisely what sorts of things could have been used. There's no right and wrong answer. This is where we're going to use the expertise of the, of the team at Butser, um, but also learning heritage craft skills, hopefully, as we go along. Um, on your right, you can see Phil Andrews of Wessex Archaeology looking at a chalk wall, and that's quite possibly what we've got, a chalky um, pulp wall um, connected maybe with, with some sort of um, weaved timbers within, some sticks, whatever. Um, maybe that's why we're, we're not seeing any sort of major structural elements in the ground in it, with the postals, because this is just local chalk, which has just gone away in the, in the succeeding years. We're going to make use of online resources too. Um, again, with the pandemic, having so much access on the internet to archaeology is, is an absolute boom. This is uh, the wonderful thesis by Rachel Pope on, on late Bronze Age and early Iron Age houses. Um, only very few have central post holes, but this is something we're looking at, late Bronze Age houses. Some of them do seem to have these holes, whether they're structural or not. Maybe we can have a, have a look at when we build this thing. But this is a resource we're able to use um, when access on the ground is, is a bit more restricted. And then we're going to put together some display boards as well to explain the processes and what we did and hopefully combine it with some artwork. Another way we can uh, engage our team in the excitement of discovery is actually learning about food. Now, some of you are familiar with the reconstruction of Colin Mann's last meal and Mortimer Wheeler at it and proclaimed that almost certainly it was suicide, the death of Colin Mann, if that's what he had to eat. And uh, we've got to get away from the idea of simply eating gruel. There were lots of wonderful uh, foodstuffs available. So we're going to bring um, Caroline in here and make some late Bronze Age meals for the team. We're also going to hopefully cast that bronze pin, not going to be uh, making them dress up like this. And certainly it's not just going to be males involved in doing this sort of activity, um, just to try and texturize this, this Bronze Age farmstead. And of course, there is the opportunity to make Bronze Age pottery because that was ubiquitous on this site. Eventually, um, we may end up with a, a Bronze Age house. Um, we may be able to add to the idea of what these structures look like. Um, Vices Museum has its example here, which is which is very impressive. Uh, this is the sort of thing that we can go and visit. I think for us, the key, having been able to do the excavation in the summer, was to engage um, enthusiasm during these dark winter months of lockdown. And the team's been able to do a lot of research into the shapes and forms of her uh, the late Bronze Age structures and also elements about what was grown and what animals might have been around. Also, what sort of um, artwork might have been present within the buildings. All these different components, it's a, it's a really key thing to be able to um, engage people. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to build the house based on the Dunchill example uh, and then publish our results. So hopefully you'll be able to see a lot more in the future. The, the Bronze Age on Salisbury Plain was a vibrant landscape and hopefully we'll learn a lot more about that in the future.